Section 11 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris. Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter. By Montague Glass. Section 11. Chapter 7. Part 2. Brothers All. It lacked one minute of five, and Abe and Morris sat in their respective desks in the firm's office, when Miss Cohen, the bookkeeper, knocked timidly at the door. "'A gentleman wants to see you, Mr. Potash,' she said. "'He wouldn't give his name.' Abe cleared his throat with an effort. "'Tell him he should come right in,' he croaked, and a moment later a tall personage clad in a fur overcoat and wearing a freshly ironed silk hat appeared in the doorway is this mr potash he asked in rounded oratorical tones abe nodded for a moment he was bereft of speech and he jerked his head sideways in the direction of his partner this is mr perlmutter he said at length my partner how do you do sir the visitor replied as he seized Morris's clammy palm in a warm embrace. "'Take a seat,' Morris murmured, dragging forth a chair, and the stranger sat down deliberately. "'Well, sir,' Abe asked, "'what can we do for you?' "'Mr. Potash,' the visitor began, "'every merchant is at times confronted with a situation which demands a few appropriate remarks.' Abe nodded and mopped tentatively at his dewy forehead. "'But how many are there?' the visitor continued. "'Who can do justice to the occasion? For instance, Mr. Perlmutter, you are asked at a charitable meeting to discuss the question of restricting immigration. I ask you candidly, Mr. Perlmutter, would you feel competent to stand upon your feet and—' Suddenly, Abe jumped to his feet. "'Excuse me, my dear sir,' he cried. "'Wouldn't you smoke a cigar?' Morris was nearest the safe, and he, too, leaped from his chair. "'Never mind the safe, Morris,' Abe said, flapping his right hand excitedly. "'I bought some while I was out just now.' He handed a gold-banded, bismarcked size cigar to the visitor, who nodded a dignified acknowledgment, and immediately struck a match. "'Yes, Mr. Perlmutter,' he went on, "'as I was saying, such a topic as the restriction of immigration would embarrass even an experienced speaker.' He paused and cleared his throat impressively. "'Now I have here,' he said, exploring the capacious pockets of his overcoat, a work entitled A Quarter of a Century in Congress by the Honorable Lucius J. Howell, which gentleman is issued upon subscription only in half Morocco or crushed Levant at a hitherto unheard of price. Abe seized mopping his brow and turned a terrible glare upon the book canvasser. What? he roared. A book agent! Once more he jumped to his feet. Out! he bellowed. Out from my office, you dirty loafer! The book agent scowled and replaced the bound dummy in his pocket. With a high-grade selling proposition like this, Mr. Potash, he said, you should be careful of your language. Morris! Abe cried. What the devil do you mean letting in a fellow like this? What do you mean letting him in? Morris retorted. Did I tell Miss Cohn she should show him in? Don't quarrel on my account, gentlemen, the canvasser said as he puffed at his cigar. I shall call again when you're not busy. He passed out of the office with a graceful gesture of farewell, and once more Abe and Morris sat down on the edge of their chairs. It was not for long, however. At this time, Without any announcement, a thick-set gentleman, with carefully trimmed beard and mustache, stood in the doorway. "'Good afternoon, gentlemen,' he said, and Abe and Morris literally sprang into the middle of the office floor. "'Mr. Steuermann!' 
Abe gasped, extending his hand. My name is Mr. Goldstein, the visitor replied, and I represent the Lily White Dress Shield Company. He proceeded no further, however, for Morris led him by the shoulder to the elevator shaft and pointed to a notice reading, Hours for Salesmen, 8 to 9.30. Morris returned to the office, and hardly was he seated in his chair when, for the third time, the doorway framed a visitor. "'Mr. Potash?' the newcomer asked timidly. He was a short, slender man, past middle age, clad in a shabby overcoat, half threadbare, and a soft felt hat of a dingy, weather-beaten appearance. "'No,' Abe growled. "'What is it now?' "'Mr. Potash?' The stranger continued. I called to see you at the request of Mr. Geigerman. My name is Stoyerman. Abe essayed to rise, but his knees would not support him, and he waved his hand feebly to a chair that Morris dragged forward. Mr. Stoyerman, Morris said, you're coming up here to see us when we could much better afford it if we would go down to see you? Why, gentlemen, it was no inconvenience for me. Stoyman replied, I am on my way home. God would bless you for it anyway, Abe declared fervently, and Stoyman blushed. Now, Mr. Potash, he protested, I am not here for compliments. I've come to see what we can all do for this poor fellow. I'm a little late because I was waiting for a report from my lawyers. Your lawyers? Abe exclaimed. Why, we already hired Henry D. Feldman. So I believe, Stoyman replied, and he was consented to act in conjunction with my lawyers, Chitty, Schwartzstein, and Munjoy. I shall relieve you gentlemen of all responsibility in that matter. Do you mean by responsibility, Mr. Stoyman, that you would pay Feldman? Abe asked. Mr. Stoyman smiled. Well, we won't discuss that just now he said. Because, Abe continued, we wouldn't consent to nothing of the kind, Mr. Stoyam. The young fellow works for us, and we've got to do our share. That part will come later, Stoyman insisted. And now, let's see what's to be done. For more than a half an hour, Stoyman disclosed to Abe and Morris the result of his lawyer's investigation. Mr. Munjoy has seen Kovalenko, Stoyman said. And he asserts that, so far as proof is concerned, no murder was ever committed. But Mr. Stoyman, Morris said, the fellow which he opened the package, you understand, was blown up so his own father couldn't recognize him even. That's just the point, Mr. Perlmutter, Stoyman declared. And Mr. Munjoy says that on this circumstance hinges the Russian consulate's whole case. They are obliged to prove that a definite person was killed. And it seems that the consulate paid the passage of the victim's father to this country, so that he might testify before the United States Commissioner. I understand that the old man, who, by the way, is rabbi, arrived last week. Mr. Munjoy says that if the father is unable to testify to the identity of the victim, it may so complicate matters that more evidence will be necessary, and the consulate may drop the affair on account of the expense involved. Morris nodded sadly. Lawyers could always make expenses, Mr. Stoyman, he said, for the Russian counselor and for us also. Never mind about expense, Morris, Abe interrupted. What does it matter, a few hundred dollars, Morris, so long as we get this young fellow free? In fact, Mr. Stoyman, I'm willing we should go half. If we could see this here rabbi and schmear him a thousand dollars, he should swear that no one was killed at all. Mr. Stoyman shook his head. That would be, in effect, Suburning perjury, Mr. Potash, he said, and Morris glared at Abe. I'm surprised at you you should suggest such a thing, Abe, he exclaimed. Seemingly, you got no conscience at all. A thousand dollars we should pay the fella. I bet you he would lie himself black in the face of a twenty-dollar bill. It isn't a matter of money, Mr. Perlmutter, Stoyman said. But why not see the old man tonight? I have his address here, and if you approached him in the right way, perhaps he might testify that he did not recognize the murdered man. That would only be the simple truth, 
and it will be just what we want as it is i'm afraid the russian consulate will intimidate him into swearing that he knew the body to be that of his son he handed morris a card bearing a madison street address well gentlemen he concluded i've taken up your time long enough i hope to see you in my office tomorrow, mr perlmutter morris nodded and was about to shake hands with his visitor when abe slapped his thigh in a sudden realization of his inhospitality mr Stoyerman, he exclaimed wouldn't you smoke something he jumped to his feet and thrust a huge gold-banded cigar at mr Stoyerman, who shook his head thank you very much mr Stoyerman said but i'm afraid it's rather near dinner time put it in your pocket and smoke it after dinner abe insisted and mr Stoyerman smilingly obliged together the two partners escorted him into the elevator and when the door closed behind him morris turned to abe with an ironical smile you got a whole lot of manners abe i must say he commented bitterly what do you mean manners abe asked what had i done tell a millionaire like mr Stoyerman he should smoke the cigar after dinner morris replied don't you suppose he's got plenty cigars of his own maybe he did got him and maybe he didn't abe retorted but in the first place morris i noticed he took the cigar you understand and in the second place morris them cigars cost 35 cents a piece morris and there's few millionaires morris which is too proud to smoke a 35 cent cigar when morris perlmutter entered the subway that evening en route for the lower east side he was in none too cheerful mood for in the excitement attending Stoyman's visit, he had forgotten to telephone Mrs. Perlmutter that he would be late for dinner. Consequently, there had been a painful scene upon his arrival home that evening. Nor had Mrs. Perlmutter's wrath been appeased when he informed her that he was obliged to go right downtown again. Indeed, his sympathy for Caesar Kovalenko had well nigh evaporated as he entered the subway he reflected bitterly upon the circumstance that first led him to hire that unfortunate young man thus there was something doubly irritating in the coincidence which seated him next to lewis Kleinman in the crowded express train he had boarded and he made up his mind to ignore his competitor's presence when lewis caught sight of him so perlmutter lewis commented without any introductory greeting you're trying to do us again morris turned and stared icily at Kleinman. i don't want to talk to you at all Kleinman," he replied and anyhow Kleinman, i don't know what you mean we're trying to do you the shoe pinches on the other foot Kleinman, and you just stop to consider you're stealing away from us that fellow harkovy which all he knows we taught him lewis Kleinman emitted a short raucous guffaw well what are you kicking about he said you stole him back again ain't it stole him back again morris repeated what are you talking nonsense Kleinman? we wouldn't take that fella back in our store not if we can get him to come to work for two dollars a week yeah Kleinman exclaimed skeptically i don't suppose you know the fella left us at all i did not morris replied promptly and if he did Kleinman, i couldn't blame him the fella doesn't want to work all his life for ten dollars a week what do you mean ten dollars a week we paid harkavy fifteen and we offered him twenty-five but the fellow wouldn't stay with us at all for two weeks now he's acts uneasy and yesterday he leaves us that's all right Kleinman," morris said as the train drew into ninety-sixth street you could easily steal somebody else from another concern Kleinman glared at Morris and was about to utter a particularly incisive retort when the train stopped. I got a change here, he announced. But when I see you again, Perlmutter, I'll tell you what you are. I don't got to tell you what you are, Kleinman, Morris concluded as he opened his evening paper. You know only too well. Rusher, Kleinman hissed as he hurled himself into the mob of passengers that blocked the exit morris nodded sardonically and commenced to read his paper he desisted immediately however when his eye fell upon a cut accompanying 
Felix Geigerman's display advertisement. It was a beaded Marquisette costume made in obvious imitation of one of Potash and Perlmutter's leaders, and the retail price quoted by Geigerman was precisely one dollar less than Potash and Perlmutter's lowest wholesale figure. That's some of Harkovy's work, Morris muttered, and for the remainder of the journey he was once more plunged in the gloomiest cogitation. Almost automatically, he alighted at the Brooklyn Bridge and boarded a Madison Street car, and it was not until the jolting, old-fashioned vehicle had nearly reached its eastern terminus than he discerned the house number furnished to him by Stoyamin. He hurried to the platform and jumped to the street, where he collided violently with a short-bearded person. "'Excuse me!' Morris cried. Then he recognized his victim. Harkovy, he exclaimed, what are you doing here? I am coming to say good-bye to friend, Harkovy replied, with some show of confusion. I got to go to Chicago tomorrow. Chicago, Morris repeated. Why, what are you doing in Chicago, Harkovy? I am now going to got a job out there, Harkovy replied. A very good job. Morris drew his former assistant cutter to the sidewalk. He had temporarily forgotten the object of his visit to the Lower East Side in the sudden conception of an idea which was no less than the rehiring of Harkovy. "'What for a good job?' Morris asked. Twenty dollars a week?' Harkovy nodded. "'A little more,' he said. Twenty-five. "'Shun good,' Morris declared. "'Then you wouldn't gotta go at all.' "'Because we ourselves would give you thirty. "'I must go,' Harkovy said, shaking his head. "'My fare paid.' "'Pay him back the fare,' Morris insisted. "'We would see you wouldn't lose it.' Again Harkovy shook his head. "'I got bonus, too,' he declared. "'A thousand roubles.' "'What are you talking about, roubles?' Morris said impatiently. "'You ain't a greenhorn no longer. Do you mean a thousand dollars?' Six hundred dollars, about,' Harkovy replied. Morris whistled. Well, he said after a pause of some seconds, put off going until tomorrow anyhow. Maybe we can fix you up to give you the six hundred dollars anyhow. Harkavy remained silent, and Morris clapped him on the shoulder. If people are so anxious to get you that they pay you a big lot of money like that, Harkavy, you could keep them waiting anyhow one day. Come round and see us tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, wouldn't you? Harkovy pondered the question for some minutes. "'If you wish it, Mr. Perlmutter,' he said. "'But I must got to go away by eleven o'clock sure.' "'Good,' Morris exclaimed. "'Then I'll see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock.' They shook hands on the appointment, and Morris turned away and ascended the high stoop of an old-fashioned tenement. In the vestibule he encountered a boy whose right cheek was apparently distorted by a severe toothache. Do a family by the name Levin live here? Morris asked. The boy nodded and disgorged a huge lump of toffee, whereat the toothache disappeared. That's me father, he said. Fourth floor, front east, he ain't in, though. Your father? Morris cried. Why, the people I'm coming to see, they're greenhorns. Oh, yeah, the youngster replied. That's me father's uncle. He lives with us. All right, Morris said. Take me up there. The youngster resumed his swollen cheek and escorted Morris up three flights of slippery brass-bound stairs. Without the formality of knocking, they entered an apartment on the fourth floor where a woman stood washing dishes. Mrs. Levin, Morris said. The woman nodded. I want to see your man's uncle, Morris continued. Without looking up, the woman cried in stentorian tones, Mister! In response, a bent figure, clad in an alpaca caftan, appeared from an interior bedroom. He wore a velvet skull cap, and a thin gray beard straggled from his chin. His nose was surmounted by a pair of steel spectacles. Shalom Aleichem, Morris cried. According to the rabbi, that greeting, as ancient as the Hebrew tongue itself, peace be with you. Aleichem Shalom the rabbi answered, and then he resorted to the Yiddish jargon, 
Do you look for me? I look for the Rav Elkin Levin, Morris said, in a tongue to which he had long been unaccustomed. I am the servant of the philanthropist Steuermann. Steuermann, the Rav Levin repeated. I do not know him. In America, Morris said, his name is honored over the governors. He sends me to you to speak for the unfortunate Tzvi Kovalenko. Tzvi Kovalenko, the old man cried, and his beard stood out as his invisible lips tightened while his nose became sharp and hawk-like. A Mishnah Bishunah to him, the same as he sent to my son. No, Morris declared. He did not send it to your son. It was another that did it. The old man sank, trembling, into a nearby chair, and clutched the edge of the table. "'You tell this to me, who I saw with my own eyes his body,' he said in shaking tones. "'Yes, Baron, I saw my own child like a slaughtered beast, all blood, not a face, but a piece of flesh. I saw him, and you tell me this?' "'None the less,' Morris went on. "'If your son did die, it was a kapora not meant for him. It was intended for the chief of police.' The Rav shook his head. It stands in the Gemara, he said in the sing-song tone of a Talmudic reader. If one flings a stone for pleasure and it strikes another so that he dies, the one also shall die. He rose to his feet and waved one hand with a flapping motion. An eye for an eye, he cried in shrill tones. A tooth for a tooth. Morris shrank back and turned to the woman who had not raised her head from the dishwashing. You tell him, he said, that the philanthropist Stoyman invites him to come to the address I shall give you tomorrow at ten o'clock. Tell him you know that when Stoyman commands, governors obey. What's it my business? Mrs. Levin replied. Tell him yourself. Your man should go with him, Morris insisted. He and you will not lose by it. Morris wrote the address on the back of one of Potash and Perlmutter's business cards and handed it to her. Put it on the table, she said. Tell your man, Morris continued. If he does take this old man to Steuermann, I myself will pay him twenty-five dollars. Once more he faced the Rav, who had sunk again into the chair. Will it bring back your son to you if Tzvi Kovalenko dies? He asked. The old man plucked at his beard. He was my son, my only son, he said. My Kurdish. A good son he was. Mrs. Levin, still at her dishwashing, raised her head and snorted impatiently. Yeah, a good son, she commented in English. A dirty low-life bum he was. If he wouldn't be that he gone read a couple of bottles of wine from the store, he wouldn't have been in the police office at all. He brought it on himself, mister, believe me. Morris nodded. What is for a buy is for a buy, he said. Tell your man he should bring his uncle to Stoyam and I would pay him short twenty-five dollars cash. He bowed to the Rav and with a final shalom aleichem passed downstairs to the street. As he waited at the corner for a westbound car, he thought he discerned a familiar figure in the shadow of the house he had just quitted. He walked slowly up the block and Harkave stole out of the basement area and slunk hurriedly past him. Harkave, Morris called. But the assistant cutter only hastened his steps, and it seemed to Morris that a sound like a sob was borne backward. "'What's the trouble, Harkavy? Morris cried. But in response, Harkavy broke into a run, and with a mystified shake of his head, Morris commenced his tedious journey uptown. When Morris, in company with his partner, entered the showroom at eight o'clock the following morning, he had already enumerated to Abe the events of the preceding evening, not omitting his encounter with Harkavy. "'I bet you he be waiting for us, Morris,' Abe said, "'and if I ain't mistaken, here he is now.' Their visitor, however, proved to be a stranger who bore only a slight resemblance to their former cutter. "'Mr. Perlmutter,' he said, "'ain't it?' My name is Mr. Perlmutter, Morris said. What do you want from us? For answer, the visitor drew from his pocket a card and handed it to Morris. Me, I am Pincus Levin, and you are leaving this by my wife last night, he said. So I am coming to tell you I am agreeable to take Mr. Levin to Steuermann's place. 
all right morris replied you can go ahead pincus levin shoveled his feet uneasily but made no attempt to depart well morris cried sure i know pincus said but if i would take uncle mr levin to Steuermann, you understand and then maybe um, i'm only saying mr perlmutter you might forget the other part ain't it you mean you want your twenty-five dollars in advance morris asked why not pincus replied if i wouldn't take mr levin today yet to this here Steuermann's office mr perlmutter you can stop the check abe shrugged his shoulders expressively an idea he cried you ain't never seen this fellow before morris ain't it Morris admitted it. Well, then what's the use talking? Abe continued. How do we know he's this here Levin's nephew? Why, Mr. Potash, Levin cried. I ain't no crook. I got the old man in a coffee house around the corner right now. Bring him up here, then, Abe said, and we'll give you your money. Pincus Levin nodded and shuffled off toward the back stairs, while Abe turned and gazed after him. I couldn't make it out at all, Morris, he said. The more I look at that fellow, Morris, the more he makes me think of this here. Good morning, Mr. Potash, a familiar voice interrupted. It was Harkavy. Hello there, Morris cried cheerfully. I thought you'd be here. Harkavy smiled sadly. His face was white and drawn, and his shoes and trousers were covered with mud, as though he had walked the streets all night. I am keeping my word, anyhow, he said. But I am only coming to tell you I got to go to Chicago. Why must you gotta go? Abe insisted. Well, certain reasons, Mr. Potash, Harkavy replied. Certain... <gasps> he struggled to control his speech as his eyes rested on the rear stairway. But his words became more and more inarticulate until, with a shudder and a gasp, he fell heavily to the floor. Oi, Gewalt! Abe exclaimed. He rushed to the office for a glass of water, but even before he had reached the cooler, he stopped suddenly. A great wailing cry came from the showroom, and when he ran back with the water, a bearded old man lay prostrate across Harkavy's body. Only Miss Cohen, the bookkeeper, kept a clear head during the confusion that followed. She dispatched Nathan, the shipping clerk, for a doctor, and directed her frightened employers to loosen the shirt-bands of the unconscious man. "'Some whiskey,' Morris shouted, and one of the cutters produced it bashfully from his hip pocket. "'Never try to force whiskey on a fainting person,' Miss Cohen cried. "'It might get into their lungs and suffocate him. "'I wasn't going to,' Morris said hastily, as he took a yeoman's pull at the bottle. "'I'm feeling faint myself.' Mir auch, Abe said, taking the bottle from his partner's grasp. After a refreshing draught, he passed it on to Pincus, who returned it empty to the crestfallen cutter, just as a physician dashed out of the elevator. What caused this trouble? he asked Abe, as he knelt down by the side of Harkavy. Abe looked helplessly at Morris and turned to Pincus Levin, who commenced to tremble violently. Hold on there, Morris shouted. He's going to faint, too. Abe seized the glass of ice water and flung its contents into Pincus Levin's face. He gasped and sat down suddenly. The old man, he murmured. He's Yossel's father. Yossel who? Morris shouted. The old man's only got one son and he's dead. Yes, I know, Pincus answered. He is and he ain't. I had always thought so, too, Mr. Perlmutter, but this fella here is Yas Eleven, which he got blown up in Harkovit two years ago. What do you mean got blown up? Abe asked, as the doctor worked steadily over the two prostrate men. How could he be blown up if he's here now? Pincus shrugged his shoulders. How should I know? He said weakly. I ain't lying here. This fella here is Yas Eleven, and my uncle there is his father. Do you mean to tell me that the old man's son ain't dead at all? Morris demanded. Seemingly, Pincus said. Ah, oh, but this is the first time I heard it, and I guess it's the first time the old man heard it, too. Harkavy moaned and tried to sit up. Easy there, the doctor commanded. 
Two of you take him inside and put him on a lounge if you have one. Abe and Morris followed Pincus and the head cutter as they supported the half unconscious Harkavy into the firm's office. Ten minutes later, the old man was restored to consciousness. Voice, he murmured. Mein Kind. It's all right, the doctor replied. And then he turned to the office. Come out here, you, and talk to the old man. Pincus came running from the office and reassured his uncle who, under the ministrations of the doctor, grew rapidly stronger until he was sufficiently recovered to be placed on a chair. "'Keep him quiet while I attend to the other fellow,' said the doctor, "'and don't let him talk.' He went at once to the office where Harkavy sat on the edge of the lounge. "'Here, what are you doing?' he cried. "'You shouldn't let that fellow do any talking.' "'That's all right, doctor,' Abe said calmly. "'He should go on talking now if it would kill him even. Go ahead, Harkavy.' And so, Harkavy continued, after I am stealing wine, they took me to police office. There was a place. But anyhow, Mr. Potish, I could tell you all about afterward. Inside backyard was dead Mujik, which he's got run over by train. His face all damaged. You couldn't tell who he was at all. He faltered and waved his hand. Give me, please, glass of water, he said. And the doctor seized his hand. Never mind. Abe cried inexorably. Leave him alone, doctor. He should finish what he's got to say. Harkavy nodded and sipped some water. Then comes package for chief of police. And they put first in pail of water. Then they open Mr. Potash, and it don't harm nobody. But them Roches want to put it on to somebody, so they make me proposition. They would give me a couple hundred rubles and a ticket to America. And I took him up. For stealing that wine, I could get five years yet. So what should I do? They give me the money. I run away. But the dead mujik they're telling everybody is me, which I am blew to pieces by the package. And you let the old man bury the mujik and think it was you? Morris asked. Harkavy nodded. Over and over again he's telling me I'm no good. He wishes I was dead. I wish I was, Mr. Perlmutter. I wish I was. He commenced to cry weakly. And Morris handed him the water. But when I hear last week the old man, my father, is here, he continued, I couldn't help myself. I'm hanging around Madison Street, trying I should get one look at him only. I didn't see him till just now. He struggled to raise himself from the lounge. Let me go to him. Let me go. Abe looked inquiringly at the doctor, who nodded in reply. Let him go. Happiness never harmed anybody yet. Gentlemen, said the United States Commissioner, as he sat behind his shabby desk in the post office building, the prisoner is in the marshal's office. Shall he be brought in? He addressed his question to Mr. Munjoy, who was seated between Henry D. Feldman and Stoyman at one side of a huge table. Opposite them were the clerk of the Russian consulate and his counsel, who was obviously nervous at the formidable appearance presented by the lawyer Henry D. Feldman. The latter was about to pull off, as in his colloquial moments he himself would have expressed it, a rotten trick on his fellow counsel. For Abe and Morris had not informed either Mr. Munjoy or Mr. Stoyman of the stirring scene in their showroom that morning. Instead, they had called on Feldman, who, with the dramatic intuition of the effective jury lawyer, saw an opportunity for a coup that would at once gain the admiration and respect, if not the legal business, of Moses M. Stoyman and procure Feldman a column and a half of publicity in next day's paper. Hence he had sworn Abe and Morris to secrecy, in consideration of making no charges for his service since he deemed the accruing benefit to be worth at least two hundred dollars. "'Shall he be brought in, gentlemen?' the commissioner asked. Counsel for the Russian consulate bowed, as did Mr. Munjoy, but Henry D. Feldman cleared his throat with a great rasping noise that penetrated to the corridor without. This was the signal, and Abe and Morris entered the room supporting the old rabbi who was followed by Pincus Levin. One moment, sir, 
feldman said i have a preliminary objection to make will you hear the offer sir the commissioner nodded and Stoyman and his counsel mr munjoy turned to feldman in amazement what's all this feldman munjoy cried feldman waved his hand impressively my objection is sir that a gross fraud has been practiced on this court it's come to my attention that somebody connected with this proceeding has furnished a material witness for the defense with a ticket for chicago and one thousand roubles as a bribe to stay away from the hearing counsel for the complainant jumped to his feet this is preposterous he declared by no means feldman continued will you direct counsel not to interrupt me sir if you please i so direct the commissioner replied whereat feldman again cleared his throat and coughed twice and in answer to this cue yasel levin alias joseph harkavy entered the room the person so bribed mr commissioner is named in the petition as the corpus delicti of the crime alleged to have been committed feldman said what munjoy and opposing counsel cried in unison and the clerk to the consulate reached for his hat and started for the door his counsel leapt after him however and succeeded in catching his coat-tails just as he was about to disappear into the hall with one hand still grasping the consular clerk counsel for the complainant turned to the commissioner i think my client wants to consult me outside for one minute he said have i your consent to withdraw the commissioner nodded, and Munjoy turned to Feldman. "'What the deuce are you trying to do, Feldman?' he asked, as complainant's counsel returned. "'If the commissioner pleases,' Feldman said, "'we consent to a dismissal of the extradition proceedings and to a discharge of the prisoner.' The imperturbable commissioner bowed and rose to his feet. "'Submit the necessary papers for the prisoner's discharge, gentlemen.' he said the hearing is closed five dollars for doing what that fella done is like picking it up off the street mars abe declared to mars when they received the doctor's bill a month later how could we be small about it abe mars rejoined look at what stoyman done not only is he paying his lawyers for getting this kovalenko out of prison but he's taking that young fella and paying for him he should go on with the studying for a doctor well, the way the doctor soak you, Morris, Abe said, looking at the bill which he held in his hand, it wouldn't be long before Kovalenko pays him back with interest, I bet you. But anyhow, Abe, Morris continued, now we got Yos Levin working for us as a cutter. It'd be a better feeling all around supposing we pay the bill and say nothing about it. I'm agreeable we should say nothing more about it, Morris. Abe retorted, because we already wasted more time and trouble than the whole thing is worth. But one thing I would like you to know, Morris, before I shut my mouth, why did this here fellow, Yaks Levin, call himself Harkovay? Say, Morris said, using three inflections to the monosyllable, he's got just so much right to call himself Harkovy as all them other guys has to call themselves Breslauer, Hamburger, Leipziger, or the Berliner. He anyhow does come from Harkov, Abe, but you would take it from me, Abe, as many a fella calls himself Hamburger, which he don't come from no nearer Hamburger than Vilna or Kovno. Abe shrugged his shoulders expressively in reply. My worries with them fellas come from Morris, he commented, because when it comes right down to it, Morris, if a fella attends to his own business, Morris, and don't monkey with politics, you understand, where could he make a better living than right here in New York, New York? End of chapter 7. End of section 11.